Well, let's jump right in. I want to read the verse that has kind of been the theme verse, if you will, for this series that our pastors have so excellently been just going through. And then we're going to jump into to six points. Number The th- first three are the traps of discontentment. And the next three are the keys, I believe, that the word teaches us to be content. But let's start in this verse. First Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 11 says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap. Keep that word in your memory, the trap. And into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. The sole focus today will not only be on our finances, but you will see a lot of references and points that I want to make when it comes to our money, our finances, these things. I find it interesting because the, the word is very clear that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, yet if you, you've kind of come to the reality of this, like life takes money, right? Okay, so we're on the same page I know sometimes, you know, we have certain believers who get to this extreme that like, no, I'm just going to believe in faith and I'm going to do all these things. No, no, the word says if you don't work, you don't eat. As believers, we, we need to be a blessing to people and, and not just a burden. There are moments where there are struggles. There are moments where it's like, man, I'm doing what I can, but it's not enough. And I get that. But we should look like Jesus in the way that we not only pray and attend service, we should look like Jesus in the way that we work, in the way that we steward the job that God has given us, in the way that we honor our boss and our coworkers. It's real quiet now because it's like, man, I'm not doing what I want to do, though. When I get to what I want to do, I'm like, for sure, I'm with you. But like Starbucks, you know, we got any Starbucks people? Got one? Which one? Let's get that discount. Which one? What are the streets? <laughs> Oh, you just like Starbucks. I mean, if you work there. No, it's all good. We got fear not coffee, though, so I can't drink Starbucks. It's just a rule. I want to talk about a group of people that I think we can relate to. The first kind of portion of the message, we're going to talk about discontentment, but then we're going to flip the script and talk about what are the keys to contentment. I don't want us just to understand, okay, that's what it looks like to be discontent, but how do we operate with faith, with expectancy, yet content in the season that God has us in? I think a group of people that, to me, perfectly summarizes this spirit or this sense of discontentment is the Israelites, as they are freed from slavery and captivity in Egypt, yet pretty early on, they're kind of already regretting being set free. Look at this, Exodus chapter 16, if you have your Bibles, starting in verse 16, the Lord sends food from heaven. On the 15th day of the second month after the Israelites had escaped from Egypt, they left Elam and started through the western edge of the Sinai Desert in the direction of Mount Sinai. There in the desert, they started complaining to Moses and Aaron, we wish the Lord had killed us in Egypt. When we lived there, we could at least sit down and eat all the bread and the meat we wanted. But you have brought us out of here into the desert where we are going to starve. They've been delivered from slavery, from abuse, from the, 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 the physical toll and mental toll of being at the will of someone else's wrath. But now because there's some uncertainty and their faith is being tested, they're like, you know what? It would just be easier to go back to what we knew and back to what was comfortable. What does the word say? Look, don't, don't be set free. It is not for freedom that Christ has set us free to be enslaved again. God longs for us to be set free, but also to stay free. I've found there's a big difference from being set free to being staying that way, to, to being delivered and actually remaining set free from getting freed from addiction, but also not returning to that addiction. Because I don't know if you're anything like me, but I think as people, as humans, we are creatures of habit. We go back to what we know sometimes, even if what we know is not where we want to be. Why is that? I, I think it's simply this. Look, the, the second our past seems better than our future or even our present, we can know that we have stopped dreaming and what God wants to do in our life. I'm not saying it's easy, but faith is not just an option, but rather a requirement to go where God is taking us and to live out the purpose and the plan that he has for our lives. I don't think it's that they love the slavery. I don't think the reality is they're like, man, if if only we could be back there because it was so nice. But I think it was easier to stay bound in what they knew than to live free in the unknown. There's something about the unknown that's, that's just 
It's either going to instill fear or we're going to make a conscious choice to build our faith. Both fear and faith are born from a soil of uncertainty. The second something bad happens, do we think about worst case scenario or do we think, what is God going to do for me getting fired from my job? The second that our rent is increased and I already couldn't afford it, it's like, man, God, I can't wait to see the blessing or our mindset goes to I'm moving back home to live with my parents. Because fear and faith both are born out of this place of simply this, not knowing what's next. And fear, as pastor would say, comes with the territory, but faith is a taught expression of saying, God, I trust you when it makes sense and when it doesn't. I trust you when I see the result and when I don't. I trust you when I feel like I should trust you and in moments where I feel like I wanna be mad at you, I trust that not only do you know where I'm at, but you know where you're taking me. I think that deep, honest question of do we trust God can't really be revealed until it's tested. I grew up in a good church, God-fearing family. I grew up, my mom was in the choir, my dad was on the board, so I, a young man would be like, man, I got a deep faith. But honestly, it wasn't until probably about 18 years old where some of those family kind of challenges and struggles came in. My parents separated, leading to a divorce. And for some, that's just the iceberg, the tip of the iceberg of what they went through. For me in that moment, it was a struggle. And it wasn't until that season where my faith really was tested and my trust in the Lord revealed, but to be honest, it was pretty weak because I started reverting to old ways of thinking because the new way of accepting what God was doing was challenging. Look, just because it's hard does not mean that God is not in it. Like we need to not only hear that, not only understand that, but live that struggles and challenges and trials does not mean that God has abandoned you. If anything, it doesn't mean you're going the wrong way. But I've found that it often means you're going the right way because you are walking into unknown territory. You are taking new ground for your family. You say, you know what? My parents struggle with addiction, but my family will live in freedom. You know what? I know it's been a generational curse of bondage and lust, but I'm gonna live in purity and hope. I will not continue the things that takes boldness because what's comfortable is to stay in the place that we've always been. And so they begin to get to this place where they're saying, you know what, like, we should have just gone back because at least there we could sit and eat. Yeah, but you were a slave. You were, you were bound by others. You didn't have freedom. Now you have freedom. But the fear of, of holding on to this faith is sending you back to places that you never wanted to be again. We wish the Lord would have killed us. People do this all the time, right? I miss going out with my old friends. But really, because I, I remember looking back on your life in that phase and you were hung over and broken and addicted. You were depressed. And for some reason, we just remember the good times. We won't see this in our life because we're perfect. But you ever had a friend who's dating someone and it's just toxic? It's just bad? And you try to tell them, but like they're so in love, you're kind of struggling to tell them? No? Is that like a, your friend now? If that's the person next to you, raise your hand. It's okay. That's your wife. Felix. My goodness. My wife and I actually do marriage counseling. Um, like, you know, it's just bad. And everyone knows it, and you try to tell them, but they can't see it. And then after, they're like, man, that was bad. And you're like, no, for sure. We tried to tell you, like, the whole time, you know, that she was kind of crazy. Like, she wouldn't, like, hang out with friends. And, but then at a certain point, a few weeks later, they start missing them, and all they remember it switches is the good stuff. And I miss her. She was so sweet. Really? Didn't she hit you? Like, didn't she, like, steal your money? Yeah, but, like, she needed help, you know. Didn't she, like, break your window? It was an accident. <laughs> Wasn't it with a bat? Like, and we start to just remember the good times. Here they are thinking back to when they were bound, like, man, we could sit then, sit now. Like, they should have just sat. Like, relax. we had all the meat we wanted. Why? Because... There is a fear of the unknown, if we're to be honest, of stepping out. And I think for a lot of people in our city and those watching, maybe we get to L.A., maybe we get here and things just aren't panning out the way that we thought they would. And we say they're not panning out how God promised, but sometimes we just put a God promise stamp on just something that we thought would happen. We have to be careful not to put the stamp of God said on something that we just hoped. God promised by this age I'd be married. Did he? Did he? Because if it hasn't happened, then who missed it? God or you? Well, God said by this point I'd be a multimillionaire. You're, you're 19, okay? God said that or you just hope for that. And I'm not saying it's, it's bad to have hopes. I'm not saying that 
that, that the goal is contentment. We just, contentment is not just sitting lazy, broken, nothing will ever happen to me. Contentment is saying, God, I believe for great things, but I trust you with whatever you have for me. I believe for all of these things to take place. I believe for breakthrough, but no matter what happens, I'm gonna honor you still because of who you are in my life. Okay, let's go through these or I'll miss them. The third one, I'm sorry, the first one, three traps to discontentment. Catch these real quick. Number one, discontentment clouds our judgment. They want it out, they want it free, nothing else mattered. The second they're free, it's all of a sudden how good it was in slavery, how good it was when I had that relationship. No, you were broken, you were suicidal. Well, all my friends are back there. Well, you just haven't embraced a new godly community. That takes effort. Don't rush in and rush out of church and say there's no community. I, I, people are so intentional, hear me. People can be so intentional in the community of the world. They go to mixers and they're finding events on Facebook and they're going to a concert and they just meet anyone and everyone. And then in church, we're in and out like it's, it's just a plague. I mean, we've got food trucks, coffee. I don't know what else we could do to create more of a moment to meet each other, but people rush in and out and they're like, man, that church just, nobody's nice. Really? We're pretty nice. Sometimes a little too nice. Like, we gotta chill out on the niceness. <laughs> Are we willing to embrace a new godly community or do we just wanna look back to our broken friendships and only see the good moments when in reality, you need accountability because accountability will remind you of the bad moments. Man, I missed that past relationship. That friend that's like, yo, you were, you were like a mess when you were together. You're like, yeah, no, you're right, you're right. I'm just like, I'm lonely. Yeah, but like, you also hated each other. No, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. You need the people that are gonna help remind you of not just these good moments because the enemy likes to convince us that the past is always better. If the past seems better, we've stopped dreaming for what God has tomorrow. I'm not, I'm not saying we can't reflect. I'm not saying we can't look back and honor what God has done, but what are we believing he's gonna do now? Discontentment clouds our judgment. The Lord said, verse number four, the Lord said to Moses, I will send bread down from heaven like rain. Tell the people to go out each day and to gather enough for that day. Basically, I'll modernize this. What do you think, Chick-fil-A or In-N-Out? In-N-Out, it's better, everyone knows this. In-N-Out is raining from the sky. Shh, it's the first time my wife said anything about the message. When I said Chick-fil-A or In-N-Out, she's like, no, she's got like a whole theory on it. In and out is being rained from the sky. And they're, they're saying, look, the Lord is telling Moses to tell the people, gather just enough for today, not, not, not for tomorrow. Whatever they try to keep overnight will get old, get moldy, they'll be warm. You can't eat it. It's gonna go to waste. Grab just enough for today. Verse number 16, this is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. And he orders you to gather two liters. That should be enough. They did as they were told. Some gathered more, some gathered less. Everyone had exactly what they needed, just the right amount. Moses told them not to keep anything overnight. Look at this. Some of them disobeyed, but the next morning, what they kept was stinking and full of worms. In a lot of ways, you have to understand their, their food in this moment would have often been almost a form of currency. The way they would trade and barter with food was money. The second thing I want us to understand about discontentment, it convinces us what we have is never enough. God is saying, look, I'm gonna provide every single day, but I just want you to get what's out there for one day, no more. And they're like, no, I got you, I got you. What do they do? The opposite. They say, I need more because there's a fear of what if God said he's gonna do it, but he doesn't. Now I know Fearless Church, a bunch of perfect people online here in LA, we've never thought that, but what if I honestly felt God was gonna provide, but there's this lingering thought, but what if he doesn't, so I need to hold on to what's mine because it's just the way that we live in this city. Well, the Bible says one person scatters freely yet gains more, and another withholds what they should give and they're always in lack. The Bible is very clear that not everything that should make sense does. And the Lord is teaching us, God wants to bless us in abundance. I'm all for that in certain moments. But there's also moments where God says, can you trust me with enough? Because if you can honor and trust me with enough, then I can give you more than enough because you didn't find your identity in the provision. You found your identity in me. The interesting thing is that we'll never have enough. I've never gotten to a place in my life financially where I'm like, you know what, I'm good. I don't need another dollar, I'm, I'm just good. If I were to ask you guys, if, if you guys never made more money, whatever you're making now, you make for the rest of your life, most people in this room would practically be like, no, nah, I need to keep up with inflation. Like, I need to keep up with life. I need to. So there is a very practical sense when it comes to our finances that I understand. But in this specific moment, he's saying, look, just get enough for the moment that you have and I will provide enough for tomorrow. I wanna read this quick story because I just felt like it so powerfully shares this. A wealthy businessman was horrified to see a fisherman sitting beside his boat playing with a small child. 
He says, why aren't you out fishing, asked the businessman. Because I caught enough fish for one day, he said, replied the fisherman. Why don't you catch some more? What would I do with them? You could earn more money, said the businessman. Then with the extra money, you could buy a bigger boat, go into deeper waters and catch more fish. Then you would make enough money to buy nylon nets. He says, you can get new nets. Then you could buy one boat, two boat, three boats. Eventually, you could have a whole fleet. The businessman said, you could really enjoy life in this moment. The fisherman looked at the businessman quizzically and asked, what do you think I'm doing now? And I read this story and it just kind of challenged me in my own thinking because if we're not careful, we can fall into the idea of what the world is telling us to believe rather than what the Bible is teaching us is correct. Because one is just an opinion, one is biblically true. And the world is constantly telling us what we have is not enough, what we have is not nice enough, I need more, I need bigger. And I'm not saying this from a platform that I got it all together and I'm teaching, you know, there are moments when I'm like, yo, I have the 13, but like I need the 15. Why? Because there's a new color. <laughs> like I, I'm, not, I'm not saying I've never had these struggles and these thoughts, but if we're not careful, we bring that into our relationship with God and we say God is enough, but I also need these 13 things to be fulfilled in my life. Especially going into a season of the holidays like here are all the things that I want that is ultimately going to bring me joy when in reality, happiness is based off of what happens to us, whereas joy is a choice in any given situation and moment. But why was God not, not wanting them to take enough for the next day? Because I believe he was testing their heart because to trust God with what's visibly in front of you is much easier than to trust him with the unseen of what he just promises he will bring tomorrow. I'm not advocating for not saving. I'm not advocating for not working hard. You have to understand that this morning. But I am advocating saying, you know what? There are seasons where God wants to bless you abundantly. And there are other seasons where God says, can you be content in the moment that I have called you to? And if you can, I have greater anointing, greater breakthrough, greater blessing for you. Number three, before we go into contentment, is that discontentment doesn't give us time to rest. When we are not content with the situation, with life, with our relationships, with our finances. If you're a driven person, which those of us in LA, those of us watching I'm sure are, the first thing we start doing is like, how am I gonna get myself out of this situation? But could you imagine we're trying so hard to get ourselves out of a situation that God has called us to, but he's really wanting us to bring him into the situation? Our prayers shouldn't be, God, get me out. They should be, God, can you come in and do what only you could do in the midst of my struggle, my pain, and my problems? Verse 21, each morning everyone gathered as much as they needed and in the heat of the day, the rest melted. Skip down to 26. You will find it there for the first six days of the week, but not on the Sabbath. A few of the Israelites did go out and look for some, but there was none. So basically Monday to Saturday, every day you go out, get just enough for that day. But on the sixth day, get enough for two days because the Lord is teaching us to honor what? The seventh day of the week, the Sabbath. And I think this word Sabbath, maybe you've been in church a while, you know it's a pretty traditional word. Maybe it's new to you. But I found it interesting that it, in the Ten Commandments, y'all heard of these? New little thing just came out, Ten Commandments. Do not murder. Let me hear another one. What you got? Do not steal. Honor your, your father and mother. No. My wife said gluttony. Someone please pray for her. It's not in the Ten Commandments. And why to me? That felt personal, you know? That's enough. No more. One of them. Do not murder, I'm like, for sure. Hopefully you didn't come in today, you're like, oh, it's new. I didn't know, like, we're, we're clear on the murder. We're clear on the covet. We're clear on, like, you know, greed, adultery, all right. In that mix is keeping the Sabbath day holy. But I think for most of us, it's like, no, that was, like, good then. But, like, this is L.A. Like, I got to work every single day. People, like, flex how much they work. Like, I don't know if you're on social media, but, like, it's just a thing. Like, you got these guys, I'm on 21 days doing doubles every day. Nobody cares, like, okay. There's almost this appeal in a worldly sense to like reveal and showcase how hard we work and we never take breaks and I haven't taken a break since 1998 and it's like good for you, but busyness does not equal productivity in the same way that busyness does not equal impact. You ever had really busy days and by the end of the day you're like, man, I feel like I didn't get anything done. Like, like I'm believing for this, I'm desiring this, I'm, I'm wanting to see movement here and I'm really tired and burnt out but I'm not seeing what, what I felt like God promised just isn't getting any closer. 
I can't help but just challenge and ask us, are we honoring what the Sabbath looked like? And I'm not someone to say up here on this stage, but that means Sunday, the second you wake up to the second you sleep. You can't, you can't drive your car like some would say. You can't do this and that. No, no. Are we creating a day, a moment, time with God throughout the week where we say, Lord, I am going to honor you? And the three things that it does, I find this interesting. Number one, it forces us to trust God. Practically speaking, because a lot of us are constantly working just to make things work out. So it puts us in a place, because some of you would say, man, I, I can't do that. It sounds nice, but I just, I got a family I got to feed. I got things to take care of, but it forces us to trust God. The second thing is we fall apart if we do not have moments of rest. Physically, like I'm not just saying in a spiritual sense, we have a physical body that if we do not take care of ourselves. You will not be a shining star meant to guide. You will be a shooting star for a moment of entertainment. You guys remember this leader? Remember them? Yeah, I don't, what happened to them? Do you hear what happened to them? I don't want anyone to ever say, do you hear what happened and then put my name in? And that is gonna become my, my, my life statement, not because I just don't want that, but because I'm going to choose moments of honoring what the Lord has put in place, choosing moments to rest. And that rest may look different for each and every one of us, but I challenge you, that discontentment will tell you, you don't got time to rest because you got to move forward. But the rest may be the very thing that will give you clarity to see what God is doing. The enemy tries to convince us to change our circumstances. Think about this for a moment. We have the authority that God has given us, right, to take every thought captive, making it obedient to Christ. So the Lord has given us authority over our thoughts. But the reality is this, can you change every one of your circumstances? You really can't. Like, I know you think you can, but like sickness in your family, financial lack, unforeseen health problems. Like, there's a lot of things. I know you'd say, oh, I can change this. I can work hard and always have money. No, there's certain things that will come your way that you do not have the authority to change. But what do we always have the authority to change? It's our perspective, our approach, our minds, and our thoughts. So what does the enemy always want to get us to try to change? Our circumstance. Like, of course, he wants to infiltrate our minds and our thoughts. I understand that. But a lot of people I meet with and talk to, it's like, no, no, the whole giving thing, right? Like, I got to get A, B, and C figured out. And, and even just going to church, like, I got to get my family right. I got to get my life right. And he gets us in this rat race of trying to change things that we can't always change. So we never get to take ownership of the one thing that we can change, our thoughts. It says to take every thought captive, making it obedient to Christ, but some of us are so concerned with trying to control our circumstances, yet neglecting what is happening up here. What is happening up here will eventually come out of here. If you are living a life of hidden sin, if you are living a broken life, and you think you could just keep going because you know how church works, you know how to put on a good smile, eventually what is taking place up here, if not taken accountable for, if not take an inventory of the thoughts and the motives will make its way to reveal the world that we live in. Now we've talked a little bit about discontentment. I want us to focus in and really finish out on what does it look like to live a life of contentment? I believe for me, one of the most impactful stories of someone who lived, especially the early years of their life content was the story of David. Let's read this together a little bit. First Samuel, if you have your Bibles, starting in chapter 16. So he asked Jesse, Samuel is coming to Jesse, who is David's father, looking for one of his boys, looking for one of his sons to go and be in the kingdom. Are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not, we will not sit down until he arrives. So David is out. He's already been neglected by his father. Jesse's like, all right, if one of my boys is gonna get chosen, it's gonna be one of you six. David, don't even worry about it. Just keep him outside yet. There's a moment where he's like, you got another son too? Yeah, David, he, he's out in the field tending the sheep. So he sent for him and him brought him in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. And his name was David? That's, that's prophetic. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the process, in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Number one, contentment brings favor. David did nothing to get this anointing other than steward what he was given and choose to be content. Contentment is a choice. He wasn't even in the room. 
So this whole thought, like if I could just get in the room with the right people in the industry, like my personality will speak for itself. Like if I could just get in the presence of somebody that can help elevate me to the next level. So we spend our time in the industry and in acting in our business, in our craft, in our career. If I could just get in the room with the right people, that's what I need because God's called me there, but honestly, God doesn't know how to get me there. God's called me there, but I'm the one that's gotta figure out how to get from here to there. He's good at calling me, but I'm gonna be the one that's gonna, how's that working for you? Because really you spinning on this hamster wheel is kind of leading to depression and anxiety because God is trying to do it a certain way, but because it looked wrong, you chose the latter. We don't have to be in the room. We have to understand that if God has called us there, all we have to do is steward where he has us in this season. David out just tending to the sheep, a job that wouldn't have been this very powerful one. You didn't have any authority over humans, but instead you were just taking care of these measly sheep. But because David was doing it well, he didn't need the acceptance of man because he had the acceptance of God. And contentment brings favor. You don't need to be in the room. You need to be obedient to what God has called you to do now. Number 17, David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you are not able to go against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man. Verse 34, but David said to Saul, look at this. Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried out a sheep or the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. So David is given the opportunity not to go defeat Goliath. David, if you don't know this, was bringing bread and cheese. He was bringing a, an Old Testament charcuterie board to his brothers. I mean, you're walking day's journey. He finally gets there with the food and his brothers are super happy, right? No. They're like, what are you doing here? Imagine if someone walked day's journey to bring you cheese and they got mad at you. You know how long a charcuterie board takes? It's like days. So David finally gets there and his brothers are not happy that he's done this. They're like, what are you doing here? Shouldn't you be back home? Now they care that he was, a, shouldn't you be back home tending to the sheep and he just ignores them. He's like, what's going on to the other men? Well, Goliath's here and his brothers that looked the part that were accepted by man didn't have the fulfillment of the courage that came when David was tending to his sheep. Well, David's like, oh, just this dude? I mean, I've killed bears with my hands and lions, so I'll take them. I can imagine in that moment there was laughter yet mixed emotions from his brothers of like, is our little brother really gonna show us up right now because we're the ones that look the part, but he has lived the part. Too many of us are going through the motions of what looking the part should be, yet we're seeing people that are living the part be fulfilled and used by God. I don't care what looking the part means to you. In the industry, it looks a certain way. I gotta have this certain management. I gotta, well really, if God has favor and he has really called you there, he will see you through to get there. Yeah. David defeats Goliath, number two, contentment brings confidence. Not even just in a spiritual sense, but practically, because in what seems like it is basic is actually preparing you to fulfill what God has called you to do. Contentment of saying, Lord, I don't know what you have planned for me, but I'm gonna be content in this process, led to him killing animals with his bare hands, so then Goliath was just one more, just like them. He kills Goliath, we know the story. But I love that, re the reality is this, whatever you are in right now, although it feels pointless, is the very point of God preparing you for where he's taking you. I had a lot of odd end jobs leading up into ministry. I worked at Forever 21, huge low of my life, to be honest. You ever been into Forever 21? Stuff's everywhere. Even the workers don't know what's happening. I was one of them, I agree. But that job taught me a lot within clothing and things that the passions I had there and just how to treat people that were rude or sharp. I did a sales job cold calling at five in the morning. You know the people you hang up on? That was me. I was that guy. And I hated it again, but what did it teach me? It taught me to be impactful and every word was important and every second was important. I wasn't wasting time and I believe that's helped me in the way that I even communicate with people. I don't wanna have fluff words. I don't wanna have extra. I wanna be impactful while I have a moment of your time. Have you heard about Jesus? And I hated the job and I quit after just a few months, but there was a teaching moment in it. I worked at Starbucks. You can only imagine the type of people that you deal with. 
We'll have people even in downtown sometimes and the people we, you know, just being where we're at and I'll have people, you handled that so well. I don't even think I did, but I'm like, man, after you handle a mom's coffee, a Karen's coffee, soy milk, whatever, you can handle anything. (laughs) Amen? My Starbucks guy? (laughs) So there was teaching moments and everything and it's not even really till looking back, but honestly, you're like, man, every one of those seasons you just conquered. No, I was super quick to clock an hour. I was two minutes late probably most of the time. Why? Because this is pointless. I don't know what God's called me to do, but it's not work here. Could you imagine, look at this, if David wasted his time of when he was supposed to be protecting the sheep because he wanted to be in the room? How awkward that is already when someone wants to be in a party they're not invited to and they show up and everyone's like, yo, who? Like, how did they... Imagine David, and they're like, aren't you supposed to be outside? Yeah, but I just want to like see what's going on. The sheep get killed, and he doesn't protect them. Then he would have maybe looked the part, but he didn't live the part. He gets there with Goliath, and he's like, I don't know what to do. I've never been in this situation before. Some of us want to skip the steps, yet expect to still hold the same destiny. We want to skip the preparation because I'm already ready, but are we? I'm ready for a family, but, but how is your purity now? Well, it'll, it'll, it'll be easy when I'm married. Married people, is it easy? No. Once I get married, then the, the, you know, the purity problems, they're just gone. Who said that? My head. I just was thinking that. Okay. Once I get a ton of money, then it's easy to get, really, because 10% of 100 grand is a lot more than 10% of $10. So, so what if we can practice right now what God is calling us to live then? Contentment is a choice It brings confidence and it brings clarity. Number three, contentment brings clarity. Verse 38, then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in hand, approached the Philistine. David wasn't used to these things, the weapons, the sword, the armor, look, because he got used to what we had, and what he had was just enough. He didn't try to change his game plan. Well, I've kind of gotten to this place by trusting God and using what I have. A lot of us, if we just had A, B, and C, we could do what God's called us to do. For him, it was a slingshot and stones, which knowing that he killed Goliath makes for an awesome story. But imagine you're there in that moment, and he's like, no, I'm good. Oh, what do you got? Slingshot? Like, I hope one of my real friends would be like, let's talk, bro. We love you. You're going to die. Like, this, you're going to die. But because he had clarity and confidence of what he has not just thought through but lived out, he knew that God will get me in the same way he's got me before. We don't need to look like everyone else in regards to what God is going to do because he is doing a new thing. You know who had armor and swords and all these things? Every other one of the men that stepped up to the line but had fear in their hearts. So I don't want to look the part yet be instilled this fear and doubt and from not living the part. He said, all, all I need is what God has given me and I have gotten used to enough. Psalm 78, I'll finish with this verse. 67 through 72, then he rejected the tents of Joseph, speaking on God's behalf and God's perspective. He did not choose the tribe of Ephraim, but he chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which he loved. He built his sanctuary like the heights, like the earth that he established forever. Look at this, verse 70. He chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheep pens. From tending the sheep, he brought him to be the shepherd of the people, Jacob, of Israel, his inheritance, And David shepherded them with the integrity of heart. With skillful hands, he led them. You see, David was rejected by men, but accepted by God. His own father didn't even acknowledge him as an opportunity to be chosen by Samuel in this moment. He had been rejected by society, by his family, by his brothers. But does it matter when God has placed his acceptance on you? What are you more passionately pursuing, the acceptance of man or the approval of God? I don't want to get to heaven and have a lot of people that liked me and was really nice to a lot of people. And and all these people said I was a good guy. And God's like, remind me your name. Well, no, remember, I did a bunch of good things, right? We know the word. 
I did signs and wonders in your name and get away from me for I never knew you. That is a personal fear and conviction, a fear of the Lord, a reverence fear of God. I don't want to live a life, as Paul said, I don't want to live aimlessly and get to the end of my own journey and be disqualified from the prize of what you have for me. Because if we could be honest, all of us at times have or will have a struggle with the approval of man. Why? Because it is innate in our culture and society to be approved by our peers, our boss, our coworker, management, friends. We long for that. And I'm also not advocating to say just as believers, we shouldn't care what other people think as long as God loves us and we're rude and brash and sharp. We should have something attractive about us, but not just our personality and our humor and these things, but it should be the presence of God that people see deep within us. Because I don't want to be so consumed with trying to be accepted by man, yet not be obedient to what God has called me to do. How do I remain expectant that God is going to do big things without being entitled? Again, it's God, I believe you can, but if you don't, I trust you. Entitlement shifts it. It's God, I believe you can, and if you don't, something's off because I've given here, because I've served, because I'm your son. Entitlement starts to get a little bit of a different perspective. I am entitled to nothing but death, hell, and the grave. But because of Jesus and his perfect love, he went on the cross in my place. I didn't earn anything. My brokenness is just a a merit of what God is doing through me and in me. I don't deserve anything But God, I honor and thank you for the gift of life and eternal life that you have given me. When we finally become content, what are we saying? We're saying, God, you are enough. And that's really hard to do, if I could be honest. My desires aren't sinful. I'm not up here saying, man, I have all these worldly desires. No, I want to take care of my family. I want to do well in life. I want to make a big impact. I want... I want my finances to save. I want to, you know, I have desires. I have dreams just like you. But the second those things begin to have a priority above just wanting Jesus, they become an idol. I think as we read of idols in the word of God, it's like, no, we're good. I don't got a a golden calf in my room. Like, it's just unrelatable. What do you have that is taking place of Jesus? Is it your time, your talent, your treasure? Is it your career? It's okay, though. I put a stamp. I'm doing it for God. Is it what God's called me to do, but in reality, I'm not spending time just in his presence? Because God is longing to be with us far greater than what we could do for him. The best moments in my relationship with my daughter is when she just wants me to spend time with her. When she wants something, it feels fake. She's sweet, she does this cute little smile, and then she brings me a pack of gummy bears. Like, it's sweet, but like, you want something. How many times do we come to, to God in our, our devotional time, our time with our Father? It's not just communing with Him, but it's just needing stuff. And, and I'm not saying God doesn't want to meet those needs. I'm not saying if you're sick, don't pray for healing because you got to be content with sickness. Please do not miss what I'm saying here. God, I'm believing for increase. No, just be happy where you're at. But once you've prayed for increase, then what do you do? Thank you for what I have. I believe anxiety, depression, so many things which I have personally battled heavily in past seasons of my life are when we do what we can do and what we are called to do, but then after that, there's, an, there's a margin of what only God can do. And we step into that margin and say, if God was gonna do it, he would have already done it. So in order to get my finances right, I'm picking up two extra jobs, no time for my family, no time for myself, because I have to. I believe there's people in this room that your intentions have been pure, I'm just doing what I'm called to do. I'm just trying to take care of my family. I live with my mom and my dad, and my mom's sick, and I got to help. And I get that it actually makes sense in a justifiable way. But what if we take a step back and say, God, I've done what I can. Can you do what only you can? I want to trust you not just in my own means, but outside of that. I'll finish just on a personal example of that. 2019, I picked up a second job. I think at one point I was working doing stuff in ministry, and I was working at two different restaurants. I had just gotten married, and it was just one of those seasons where I took on extra weight because I felt like I had to. I, I didn't want to not provide for my family. I didn't want to, my intentions were pure. I wasn't taking money, like everything was clear, but it's just something I had to do, so I was working a lot, and I really felt God tell me not to get another job, and I did. Great man of God, right? 
I started working. I'd open at one restaurant, 9 or 10 a.m. to like 3. Then I'd work from 4 to like 2. Rush to work, change in the car. I started getting sick. I started having stomach problems, like genuinely. Went to the doctor a bunch of times, and they're like, nothing's wrong. And I'm like, you ever like felt sick, but nothing's wrong, and it just drives you crazy? For the first time, I experienced the physical toll that our mental health has attached to our body. Went to the doctor, and after a few even just times of being there, I mean, I'm sick. I can't eat most foods. My stomach is just a mess. It's starting to feel like pressure and just uneasiness, all sorts of stuff. My doctor's like, you have, like, I'm going to diagnose you with anxiety. And I'm like, appreciate it, but I'm going to just pray through this one. God bless you, doctor, you know. Got worse, got worse, didn't stop working. Had no time for myself. Spent no time with my wife, which we'd only been married a couple years. And Why? Because it's something I had to do. Again, I wasn't out living in sin. I was just doing what I felt I needed to do, even though I felt like God was leading me another direction. Fast forward, that sped into a place come 2020, COVID lockdown of brokenness, depression, genuinely having these suicidal thoughts, feeling tormented in my sleep, restlessness, panic, and anxiety attacks. And for the first time ever, I realized, oh, there is a depth to this that is darker than I thought. And some of you can understand and relate to that. I was physically sick because of my mental well-being so off and it went far beyond stress and work. It went into my upbringing. It went into my childhood. It went into this reality. If I'm gonna do it, it's because I did it, not because God did it. Financial blessing, it's because I'm gonna work hard for it. I don't wanna be blindsided. I felt blindsided by my parents' separation and divorce and there was an internal shift that I made that said, God, I love you, honestly, but I don't trust you. There's people in this room that you come in here week in and week out and you say, I love God, but honestly, do you trust him? Do you trust him for your spouse? Do you trust him for kids? Do you trust him in your career? Because I would have said yes, but my actions, as always, sp spoke a lot louder than my words. And I wanted to trust him, but I just didn't trust him. And I was broken and God allowed me to get to a place through this brokenness where healing came forth. I wish I could say it was one prayer, one moment, but it was honestly allowing everything to come to the surface so that I can clean the slate and allow the Holy Spirit and the power of our living Savior to redeem me. But then look, I began to pray these prayers, and I know you've prayed them in your most challenging, broken moments of life. God, if you just get me out of this, like, I need nothing else. Like, literally, I'm so broken. I, I, could, I wasn't leaving the house. I probably lost 30 or 40 pounds. I was sick in body, sick in spirit. Like, I didn't know what was gonna happen, so I began to pray these desperate prayers desperation will drive you to your knees and to a place you've never been in your walk with God. And I believe that's where he wanted me, but I began to pray these prayers. They sound like this. God, if you just get me out of this, like I'll never ask for anything. God, if you can just bring me out of this place, like I'll live, I'll do everything for you. You ever prayed these kind of prayers? And he did. Over the course of weeks and months, I began to realize the depression was lifted. The anxiety was subsiding through a healing process that the Lord brought me through. But here's where it took a turn. I don't know, sometime in the last year, two years, I don't even think I realized it till we went into this series of, I'm asking God for stuff, but, but almost to an unhealthy way. I'm not just saying protect my family. I'm, I'm kind of discontent again. Why? Because I thank you for what you did, but I'm on to the next thing. It was good. I know I said I'd never ask for anything, but like, I want a lot of stuff, and, and he is teaching me and training me. And I have to ask myself that. Is God enough for me if he did nothing else? Like if God just said, this is what I have for you and nothing else, would I find contentment in this life? Because if not, then I need Jesus and. I need Jesus and a spouse, and David, then I'll be happy. I need Jesus and more money. You have pure intentions, you gotta pay off debt, you gotta get ahead, you gotta just try to survive in this life, but Jesus and anything will not fulfill you until you realize all you need is Jesus and everything else follows the heart and the hand of our loving Father. If I could just be like David in that season of saying, God, if this is where you have for me right now, I wanna be the best person I could possibly be. Some of y'all would say, man, I'm called to preach. Right now you work at a job, how, how are you ministering there? Well, no, I'm called to like preach on the platform. Well, your coworkers need Jesus, right? Do they know about Jesus because you work there? How long have you been there? Two years. They know you go to church? No, 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 like when I'm at work, like that's like work mode. 
Because I don't know how many times Jesus went to like a conference and spoke. If you can find the passage, please. But most moments he was actually being distracted from what he was going to do. As Jesus was on a journey, blank, fill in the gap, he went to heal, he went to minister, he went to love. Man, I'm called to be an actor. Well, right now you're an Uber driver. So once I, once I get to that point, I'm gonna make an impact for Jesus. Well, making an impact to the million is gonna be a lot harder than the impact to the one. How are your drives going? What music are you listening to? How are you ministering to them? And I'm not perfect. Before being even in full-time ministry, as I was working jobs, there are definitely moments that I just was checked out because God's got something big for me. Well, what if this thing that feels little is a necessary step to what I think is big? And if I can honor what feels little compared to what feels big, I'll realize it's not about big and little, but about being obedient in every step that God has called me to fulfill. Let's stand to our feet. Stand to our feet. We'll finish in just a moment. Let's close our eyes and bow our heads. We'll be done in just a moment. If you're in this place, and you would just be honest, no one looking around, and you feel discontent, like you just do, I'm going to give you a moment to just be honest. I'm going to give you a moment to just be real. Maybe it's in life. Maybe you just thought you would be further along. Like you came out here and even though you didn't want to act like you thought you'd make it right away, you just did. You thought you'd have kids by now. You thought you'd have a family. You said by this age, I'll be financially free and you feel more bound. There's discontentment. I'm not talking about you have dreams. I'm not saying you have goals. No, no, you wake up and you go to bed and you feel frustrated because you feel stuck. If that's you, I want you to lift your hand. Nobody looking around. Yeah, lift your hand. Hands are going up all across this place. You feel stuck. I know God's in it, but I just, I don't see it. Put your hands down. Eyes closed. If you're in this place and you would even say, beyond feeling stuck, you love God, you, you, you honor him, but you really just have a hard time fully trusting him because of how past situations have played out. Your trust has hindered because of it. Would you lift your hand? I wanna trust God, but I'm struggling. Let me say this, open your eyes. Look at me. Often in scripture, one of my favorite things, I don't know if it should be, but it is. Jesus would ask them, do you have faith? Do you believe? And they'd say, yeah, we we believe. But help us in our unbelief. And that encourages me because like, I do believe you, God, but like sometimes it's tough. My brother does not know God. I have an older brother that I'm like, man, at this point, it hasn't happened yet, like, will it? They would often say that, he would ask them, do you believe you can get well? Do you believe, do you have the faith? And they'd say, yeah, we have the faith, but also help us, because like, we don't. <laughs> help us because I'm struggling. Help us because like, like it sounds nice, but it's easy, David, like rent's due, life's happening, my kids are growing up, and. It's only getting more challenging. God is okay with your doubt, as long as that doubt is turning into faith. I don't believe God is loving us in a place of doubt, that that he's not loving the doubt that we have if it remains there, but he's okay with the honesty of God. I'm struggling to believe. I'm struggling to believe for a family. I'm struggling to believe for kids. I'm struggling to believe, but help me in my unbelief. Is that our prayer? Or is our prayer just a victim prayer? God, why have you left? No, no, no. I'm struggling to believe and please help. Like if anyone can change my heart, you can. Unbelief and doubt, these things lead to frustration. They lead to just a hardened heart and we still believe for others. That's the problem. We justify it because I believe God could use Felix. I believe that God could use Tobias. I believe that he'll do it for you. But all of a sudden when it comes to us, it's like, no, I don't need prayer. I'm good. I'm okay. I go to a church, I tithe, yeah, but God just doesn't have that for me. Really? Or has it just not happened yet? Fearless Online Church, man, what an amazing day so far. Right now is an opportunity for us to give back. We've been receiving so much. I I don't know about you, but I've been blessed from what's going on in this stream and what God is doing in this church. Proverbs 19, 17 says this, Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and he, the Lord, 
will repay him for his deeds. This church is all about reaching the needs of our city and cities worldwide. In fact, last year alone, we were able to pass out 2.2 million pounds of food. Come on, somebody, that's a lot of food. We, we gave out food and we were able to pray for every single person. We also washed their cars, pretty much the modern day uh, version of washing someone's feet. Man, what an awesome experience that we've got to have through generous givers just like you. You may not be able to be here on ground zero level, feeding people, clothing people, loving on people, but you sure can be a part of this by giving your finances and lending in a sense to the Lord. And we know that you can't outgive God. I've found over 41 years of life that no matter how much I give to the Lord, He always gives back. He gives back so much more, no matter how much I release. I really believe that the spirit of generosity is alive in our generation. We need to meet people's physical needs so they'll open their heart so God can meet their spiritual need. Would you help us do that? We wanna give out more clothing. We wanna give out more food. We wanna touch thousands more people. In fact, this year, I'm believing to give out 4 million pounds of food. Would you step out in faith with us? Would you become a partner today? Everything in life to get anywhere really takes partnership. Every one of us are here because of partnership. Life happens because of partnership. I have a dream that we would reach people's physical need to give them a spiritual truth. Who Jesus is, who Jesus wants to be in their life, that love that we so boldly profess as Christians. Would you pray today about your gift, whatever size, large or small, that you're gonna partner with us once a month to see God do something incredible in a city. You can sign up for Fearless Partners today. Why wait another day? Let's be generous like our God and watch that generous God while we bless others continue to fill our, our vats, our barns, our, our dream, our business, our family fuller than we ever could have ourselves. God bless you as you give today. Let me pray over your giving as I believe people are moved today to become generous and partner with the Fearless Partners. Jesus, we pray over this giving. We pray over these people that are so into this ministry. We, we say right now, God, Lord, as we lend to the poor, as we help those in need, Lord, that you would help those that are giving. In Jesus' name, 